Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Lisa Marie Nancy. I am the uh, OpenStack ambassador for the United States and also uh, run the OpenStack user group in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I am super excited to be joined by a couple of my uh, esteemed colleagues from the OpenStack ecosystem to do, uh, we haven't done this in our meetup for a while, an online meetup um, in webinar fashion. So first of all, a really big thanks to Trilio for sponsoring this for us and to Brian and Billy for uh, spending the time with us this morning. And I wanna also give a special shout out to uh, those of you from the San Francisco Bay Area user group, but also all of you in our user group that aren't in the San Francisco Bay Area and can't join us um, monthly or every every other week when we do our meetups here. So super happy to, to come at you online. Um, I'm going to start out by just giving you guys a um, kind of an overview of what we've just released in the um, in the Pike release of OpenStack, um, and then I'll hand it off to Brian and Billy after that. Um, so for the Pike release, if we can advance the slides, can we miss slides? Mm -hmm. uh, Caitlin, can I get your help advancing the slides? Okay, I'm only seeing the title slide still. All right, there we go, perfect. Um, okay, so as you know, Pike is the 16th release of OpenStack. It went out on August 30th, and this is actually really cool. This is the first cycle that we had that where we kicked it off at the, the PTG meetings. So the first PTG meeting was in February in Atlanta. Uh, the, the second one just happened a couple weeks ago in Denver. I hope some of you guys were able to make it to one of those. Um, and the Queen Cycle was actually kicked off at the first ever forum in Boston during the summit, and we're doing another one in Sydney. So um, I hope you guys can join and participate in these. And uh, the point I'm making is that the work that we've done in the community to loop operators and developers closer together is really starting to pay off and you can really see that um, in this Pike release. Um, so some of the bigger themes for this release were around the adoption of edge computing and the resurgence of private cloud and we've had the numbers in the recent user survey really reflect that but we also saw a big momentum in public cloud. This surprises a lot of people particularly in the United States. There's more than 25 OpenStack public cloud providers in 60 availability zones and there's an ongoing interoperability effort towards making it easier to move workloads among those public clouds. So a lot of really good work that was done there. Um, technically, some of the key takeaways were, um, you know, every, every release has hundreds of features that go into it, but these three here are, are kind of the three big themes of this release. User experience and manageability, the community continues to focus on this. This has always been a thing, but we've, we've continued in Pike especially, um, specifically like with lifecycle life management of the OpenStack control plane. So in the early days, people were working on an install and getting the clouds up and running. Um, but as you know, a cloud is a, a living, breathing thing and it has to run at scale and heal itself and continue to operate over time. So we've got seven years now of lessons learned from running OpenStack Cloud. Um, and those lessons have been making their way back into the upstream community and now there's a lot of work uh, in different projects around lifecycle management. So what you do uh, from you know day one across the number of years that you're running the OpenStack environment, we're taking all of that into account. And one of the more popular updates is the COLA project, which uses containers to run OpenStack, to run the OpenStack control plane. There's also OpenStack Helm, and this is a new project that's not official yet, um, and that also leverages Kubernetes or other orchestration systems to manage those OpenStack services in order to have faster setup times, but also the ability to do more controlled update upgrades and uh, to automate the fault resolution. So if an API service falls down, Helm or the Kubernetes environment can restart that and get the cloud up and running again. So that's super cool. Um, flexibility and scale is all about scaling OpenStack production environments that have been around for years and getting they're getting larger and larger. And the guys are going to talk about this more later, I'm sure, because um, this is kind of their sweet spot. Um, but this is essential for these large environments and customers to be able to continue to grow their businesses and to run those critical workloads. Um, and then composability and modularity. 
there was a lot of demos in Boston about this, and particularly like on the, on the main stage keynotes. Um, composable infrastructure gives you the ability to take the OpenStack services and piece them together and deliver the functionality that your applications need and create something really powerful for your environment. Especially for this release in particular, the work that was done around Ironic and Cinder with the services standalone to integrating Cinder volumes directly to Ironic without any usage of Nova and Ironic and Neutron to have tighter integration of the network functionality with multi-tenancy. So this enables those use cases that we've actually seen a lot of people experimenting with and a lot of those are now going into production. So those are the big themes of this release. I'll dive into a couple of key technical features that I think are very important to point out um, that may not be on your radar. Um, so Python, is this is an interesting one. Um, yeah, if you could, oh, I got it, I see, okay. Um, so Python is, uh, uh, you know, support for Python 3.5. This is really important because as you guys I'm sure aware Python 2 is the version that's been running for over a decade and specifically Python 2.7 for the last four years that's what OpenStack um, has been standardizing on and this these versions are being end of life by most of the Linux distros and many other platforms uh, that are running OpenStack. So there's some pretty big differences between Python 2 and 3, and there's even more big differences between 3 and 3.5. And so this is a really a heavy lift, and the community is working super hard to stay ahead of this to make sure that the OpenStack services are fully supported in the coming version of Python, to make sure that we don't have a ton of technical debt to fix when in fact, this actually does happen. So this really gives everyone the time to do these upgrades on their own schedule and in a way that isn't disruptive to their business. Um, so here's another area where we're really taking care of our users now and well into the future. So just wanted you guys to be aware of that. Um, the next thing, thank you, is uh, Cinder, Cinder, a lot of work uh, was done by the, by the Cinder team. I just really gotta give them a shout out. Um, one of the cool things, is you can um, you can take snapshots in Cinder, but now you can actually move your volumes back and forth within the snapshot. So you can quickly take a VM back to a known good state, and um, it's kind of like a time machine. If you think about it in that way. So time machine for your virtual servers that are backended by Cinder. So if you have um, data corruption and you need to go back to a known good state, or if you have a test environment that you want to reset to a clean state, this is this is where this will really help you. Um, with this release, it's really simple to do those those kind of things. And this is going to continue to improve uh, across all the Cinder drivers by the Queen's release. So uh, the team's continuing to work on that, but they've got it started. Um, for the next, another much requested feature for Cinder that we included in Pike is the ability to extend the size of a volume. So you can attach a Cinder volume to a VM. It looks like a hard drive inside that VM. And what you can now do is increase the size of that virtual hard drive without shutting down the virtual machine or interrupting the operation of that server. So this was a much requested feature and we got it supported up through Nova and the projects that depend on Cinder. So very cool and good job for Pike. Um, for Ironic, the, uh, the Ironic team has rolled out rolling upgrade support. Um, can I have the next slide please? Thank you. Um, rolling upgrade support and um, most of the core services have had this, but now Ironic also enables operators to update the underlying control plane, plane for Ironic without having to restart the Ironic serv services or incur any downtime on the fleet of bare metal servers that are running your business workloads. So this was a great update for manageability and for ongoing maintenance of the cloud. Um, okay, next. The, um, actually, sorry, I just went to that one after. So one of the um, super cool, this is probably my favorite slide on here, because there's been a ton of work done in um, if to, to grow OpenStack and to embrace in adjacent technologies. And if you guys came to the, the summit in Boston, you would have seen this on main stage and also on the various tracks throughout the summit, and you'll see this again in Sydney. This is so important, a hugely important element that's driving OpenStack growth and adoption. This cross-community continuous integration, uh, there's actually a name for it. I think the Linux Foundation calls it XCI. Um, so you might see others using that term as well. Um, but it's cross-community cross -continu cross continuous integration. And you know, here you can 
see the logos of a diverse group of open source projects that uh, the community uh, the OpenStack community is working really closely with. And I can attest to that because in the meetup that we run for our user group, we featured at least four of these and we featured Kubernetes about 10 times since last summer, um, since last year. So we really are embracing um, these adjacent technologies and this collaborative effort is driving innovation faster than any one community could ever achieve alone. So um, just to name a few, Open Contrail is another uh, good community member, and we've done meetups with them as well. Um, so good work. If you belong to any of these communities and you want to be part of the OpenStack user groups as well, please just ping me and we'll get you scheduled to, uh, to, to come and show all of your goodness off to the OpenStack community. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, I think what's, oh, well, the next slide is just how you can find us if, in case you're looking for us. There's a lot of ways to stay connected. Um, but I'm going to hand this over to Brian Garrett of ESG, which is a leading industry analyst firm. And Brian founded the ESG Lab practice, um, which performs testing and analysis of data center technology products. Brian is a renowned expert in the enterprise storage and infrastructure markets, and he's got more than a decade of experience. So I hope you guys queue up some really good questions for him um, by the end of, of his talk. And then after that, we'll hand this off to Billy Field. Billy's the director of cloud architecture for Trilio Data, which helps customers with data protection, business continuity, and migration software specifically for the OpenStack market. Um, Billy started his career as a software engineer at EMC, so he understands customer issues from both the technical and the business side of things. So I'm super excited to share the stage with both of these experts in our field. And Brian, I will hand it off to you. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, and hello, everyone, and glad you could join us today. Uh, we're going to be um, talking a little bit about some uh, hands-on testing and validation that we've done of the Trilio Vault, a data protection solution for OpenStack environments. Uh, Caitlin, can you move on? I'll give you a little background on uh, who we are and what we do, and then we'll dive right into things. Um, so I work with the Enterprise Strategy Group. We're an industry analyst firm. We we're, uh, cover enterprise class IT technology. We've got a real strong heritage in uh, data protection and in data storage. We've been uh, covering and, and uh, you know, I myself personally have, you know, more than uh, 20 years of experience making uh, data protection and storage technologies, and we've been validating uh, solutions now for about 15 years. We've done about 800 projects. So we sit actually between um, the IT professionals like yourselves on the phone, um, the technology companies like Trilio Vault and, and, and the open source communities as well, and also the investment professionals in the media trying to provide market research. We do surveys and, and demand side market research. Um, traditional analyst advisory services and analysis, but that top co uh, corner to the right, the validation is the part of the business that I run where we do technical and economic validation. And today I'm pleased to be showing you technical validation of the um, of Trilio Vault. Next slide, please. So within uh, the enterprise strategy group, uh, the ESG lab, we do hands-on testing analysis and we create ports like the one you can see a quick peek of the cover shot, uh, cover page for the, uh, the Trilio vault. And our goal here is through hands-on testing and um, working with product experts like, like Billy, uh, who you'll be hearing from later, to uh, watch a product, see if it works as advertised, validate things like performance, usability, scalability. Uh, we'll be touching on those factors here. But most importantly, we try to make these be real easy so that uh, to consume so you can see what was tested, how it was tested, but most importantly, why this matters. You know, we try to put a business lens on it, ideally backed by our demand side research, trying to show that it solves problems that you, uh, you're facing today. Next slide, please. So in the uh, Trilio Vault, the areas that we uh, focused on that I'll skim through quickly here, and, and you can take a look at the report um, offline later, uh, are ease of deployment, manageability, performance, and scalability, obviously all in an OpenStack environment. Next slide, please. Let's jump in with ease of deployment. Well, actually, uh, before we do that, we'll, we'll show a little bit of our uh, uh, market, demand side market research. We do annual surveys on um, uh, IT spending intentions and in particular around data protection. Um, and as you might expect here, uh, you know, cost, performance, and recoverability um, are on the top of the uh, data protection challenges. And as you're probably not surprised uh, to hear that annually at the CIO level, when we're asking anybody who's involved in IT purchasing decision, make, uh, decision making, uh, data protection and recoverability 
uh, usually ranks in the top three. Sometimes it bounces around lately. It's been trading places with cyber, um, but it's always up there. It's a problem we've been, you know, trying to solve for 30 years and, um, and we'll continue to be solving it because the environments keep changing. Next slide, please. So to that point, uh, what we're seeing uh, in our latest annual survey, we're seeing that 96% of respondents plan on maintaining or increase their spending on data protection. So data protection isn't something you can just spend on and have it be done. It's something where there's continuous investment on. And the reason for it, uh, Jason Buffington, who uh, leads our, he's a lead analyst for us for data protection, a really, really great guy and a smart thought leader here. This is his, uh, you know, his saying is that when you modernize production, you, you need to also modernize protection. And we've seen this in the industry a bunch of times, and most recently uh, with the adoption of uh, virtual server technologies like VMware and others, um, we saw that we needed to rethink how we did data protection. If we took the traditional methods and dropped them in a virtual machine, they weren't optimized, and eventually the uh, APIs uh, within the hypervisor uh, allowed data protection uh, solutions to adapt to be better suited to them. And you saw companies like uh, Veeam come along to be building custom solutions, purpose-built and integrated native um, into virtualized environments. We're seeing the exact same behavior happening here in the OpenStack and Trilio Vault is kind of a lot like Veeam. They're very, very focused on trying to uh, make the data protection um, uh, in OpenStack environments be integrated and granular and recoverable and fast as we're gonna see. Next slide, please. Uh, one more, the ESG lab validation. So now we're diving into uh, a couple of highlights from the report. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna start with uh, deploying and configuring. Uh, so there's a couple of components to uh, the Trilio Vault architecture. The, the data mover uh, technology is installed as a native service on the, native, on the Nova compute nodes. Um, there's a uh, Trilio appliance um, VM. And then there's a, a plug into the OpenStack Horizon management interface on the OpenStack controller that uses uh, Trilio Vault APIs to communicate. It's a quick picture of the kind of the, you know, wizard driven, just click here to download and install each of these components. And um, we, uh, we did this uh, working with, um, with the folks from uh, Trilio Vault in a, in a test bed. And uh, it was less than 30 minutes and very, very straightforward to get this thing up and running. So easy to deploy and configure. So let's move on. And what we've got is, a, uh, you know, what we witnessed was, you know, modern web browsable, easy to use management interface for um, setting up um, policies and uh, using disk-based snapshots to, to, uh, to automate uh, easy recoverability. And um, as you can see here, you can set things up by, by workload and, um, and by policy. You can set up policies for uh, protection. So we're going to be using disk-based snapshots. You can set up kind of gold, silver, bronze, and you know, uh, have more frequent um, snapshots. And there's also uh, integration with OpenStack um, replication technology so that you can be uh, doing backups and getting those backups safe to a remote site for rec uh, remote recoverability. Next slide, please. And most important, this is one of the things that's kind of missing usually early when we come into a new production environment that doesn't have native data protection tools built in is the ability to do selective restores. And in this case, it means selectively restoring a VM or a file. And now we're starting to see um, uh, Trilio Vault is providing um, application specific interfaces uh, as well, for example, MySQL. And, and you can see here that in this case, we're doing a selective restore to another location and showing that we can restore a VM in another region or another availability zone. We define the network for that. We select the virtual machines, um, select the type of uh, VM resources that we want to be spun up um, where what this recovery is going to land. And up top, you see it's pretty, pretty intuitive uh, to pick the, um, the, uh, the, the snapshot the snapshot that you want to restore from, and then what you want to what, want to do with that um, to selective restore it, um, to mount that directly, to use it, um, or or delete that to clean up and groom. So selective restore, really important capability. Monitoring again, uh, you know, nice modern, good looking uh, GUI here, and this is really important in data protection environments to be able to see the performance of backup jobs as they're running, to be able to track the success of the backup jobs, uh, to to uh, to and, and of restores, and we found this to be you know right up there within the uh, you know the latest modern data protection appliances, um, uh, user interfaces, very very 
straightforward, intuitive, web browsable from anywhere, responsive, all the good stuff. So next, let's dive down into a uh, little bit about the architecture. In, um, and in this case, we did um, uh, uh, a backup of, of a, uh, I think it was a 40 gigabyte data, data set. And what we wanted to show is that the architecture is scalable to meet the demands of, um, you know, of the agile cl cloud environment. As your OpenStack is, is growing to meet the needs of the business, um, you need to be able to grow your data protection infrastructure and the horsepower of it, in this case, the data mover horsepower, to be able to keep up. In this case, we were showing that you get near linear performance scalability as you increase the number of data movers that are working to, uh, to provide, in this case, the first full backup. We'll see later on that the incrementals are, uh, are have a lighter resource. Um, and uh, this near linear scalability, there's theoretically no uh, limit on the end to increasing the, um, the data mover um, performance capability here. So that's one of the potential bottlenecks in uh, data protection, um, either uh, backup or recovery performance path. And obviously where you're backing up from and to, in this case, the NFS um, uh, and the infrastructure um, of the OpenStack um, source where you're backing from, backing up from, and two, is could be another potential bottleneck that you'd have to tune, but the data mover itself, it's very easy to make sure that you're architecting so that that isn't the bottleneck. Next slide, please. So, uh, Trilio Vault is integrated with native services in OpenStack to use disk-based snapshots. This is really, really important. It's, uh, and it's because of this, we, it uses, um, uh, basically forever um, incremental technology um, and uh, and actually kind of rolls uh, in, in what I, I consider kind of like a, a rolling synthetic full. Uh, the uh, the Trillium Vault team might uh, help correct me on my terminology here. But th the main, the benefit here is that after you, you only need to do a full backup once ever. And from then on, that's incremental. And here we're, here we're showing the backup duration in seconds. The, the first one took about 34 minutes, and the, uh, the subsequent ones took about six minutes on average. Next slide, please. So why does this all matter? One more. So, you know, data protection and recoverability has been a challenge for a long time because downtime can impact productivity and revenue. If you're providing this as a service, you know, uh, OpenStack um, uh, services to your organizations, you're trying to provide the agility and availability of, of you know, of a cloud-based uh, service, either internally for your organization or as a paid-for service. So if you're working as a service provider, you need to be um, uh, online and available and need to avoid downtime. And when downtime happens, you need to be able to get back up as quickly as possible. OpenStack um, and Trillo Vault is uh, purpose-built and, and built into and leverages native OpenStack for um, uh, services for backup and recovery. And ESG Lab, we validated, validated it definitely works as advertised. It's very, very easy to deploy and configure and to manage and that has a scalable architecture to scale meets in the business and you can do really fast backups and you can do really quick selective restores. So thanks a bunch. Uh, I'm going to pass off to Billy who's going to give you a quick tour and an online demo. Live demo no less. Go Billy. <laughs> Love the courage. <laughs> may, may, may the demo gods be with us today. There we go. Yes, <laughs> may the demo gods be with you. All right, we're doing a little switch control here of the screen. Can everybody see my screen? Lisa, can you see it just to make sure? Yes, I can. Okay. Let me just, um, Brian, thank you. That was a great tee up. Uh, again, this is uh, Billy Field with uh, with Trilio. I, I run the uh, the cloud architecture team here. so. Uh, I have the joy and privilege to talk to you know everybody at meetups, uh, at the summits, but also uh, to hear the challenges that we're we're, we're continually running up uh, running into in the uh, backup and recovery space, uh, specifically with OpenStack. So thank you for taking the time today. Um, I really wanted to nail down. This is a demo, but I really want to do a prelude here to to kind of set the table on what Trilio is, right, and the value prop. So. Uh, with the slide that you're seeing, so OpenStack, as you all know, is, is a series of services that are spun up, right? And what tr the inception of Trilio was that in order for us to grow and scale and to be cloudy, 
um, we need to fit this model, right? We need to be another pillar within OpenStack uh, as a service. And, and when we are the data protection as a service aspect for OpenStack clouds, okay? Um, and, as, and, and to the right, how to achieve these, um, these attributes of the cloud, we, we gotta kind of fit in, in conformance to that, right? So uh, we gotta be uh, downloadable, um, you know, seamlessly through a portal, just, you know, download our code and go. Um, we can't be clunky heavyweight agent, much like the legacy topologies, right? Because you're, you're, you you run into many bottlenecks and challenges there. Uh, cloud is built with tenant, you know, the tenant and tenant in mind, right? Multi-tenancy. So we got to have those attributes as well, along with the scalability and flexibility to, to get the, the solution installed. Uh, I'd, I'd actually even throw in manageability here as well. But when you install Trilio, we have to be non-disruptive, meaning we can't reboot a bunch of your server, a bunch of your compute nodes and your, and your control stack. We can't do any of that. We got to seamlessly slide in there. And the last thing here is as these workloads grow and grow and grow, the nature which Brian just talked about is, is a we do a full once and then we got to get to that incremental daily rate of change, you know, the industry three to five percent rate of change because your backup windows, uh, you know, you'll, they'll, they'll shrink drastically there. You only have so many, you know, 24 hours in a day to do stuff. So as these data sets grow and grow, we got to make sure we get that stuff backed up and protected. And then the last thing is this is the most crucial, right? We are OpenStack native and, and Brian kind of touched a little bit about it, but we, we, we hook into every uh, OpenStack native API call. Uh, we, we talk to each uh, API endpoint. Um, I will say I only have 10 minutes here. So please, uh, uh, I'll set the table here for the next slide here. So if there's something of, of interest to you guys, please reach out there to the right, go to Trilio.io, uh, request a demo. We can dive deeper here, uh, talk about the, the knobs and buttons that we do to get things done here. Um, setting, setting the table, so what, what, is, what, support, what, is, what is Trilio support? Um, so which version of OpenStack? We, we started back in the, actually the ice house days of when things were trying to you know, figure out what was going on. Uh, and we've qualified all the way through Okada. Within uh, a couple weeks or so, we're gonna be uh, having the pike uh, kickoff stuff for qualification for our Q4 release. Okay, so we're, we try to be a N minus one topology from version perspective and we stay, every quarter we stay right to that tried and true. And then when you see what I do here in the demo, the question usually comes up is which distributions of, 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 of OpenStack do you guys support? And you see right there on the bottom left, uh, we, we got most, most of them. Um, We've got SUSE, Red Hat, Morantis, Canonical, and uh, Upstream. So as you can see, my, my DevOps team and, and test teams are, are heavy at work every quarter trying to get each distribution uh, supported, uh, tested, and check marks so that my, my team can go out and, and uh, provide backup and recovery for whichever distribution you guys are on. Okay, so let me flip over here. Um, do we want to take a, let's see here. All right, there we go. All right, so... I'm logged into my, my live demo here, as Lisa said. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure this works nice and neat for you guys. So the first thing I, I want to kind of show you guys is, is we are tenant level, we're tenant driven. So when you, when you log in here as a tenant, you'll see the compute network and object store uh, buckets there. But what you'll notice here at the very bottom is we expose uh, a backups tab, right? So we have our own Horizon plugin that seamlessly gives you all the interactions and the functionality of Trilio built within a, a UI metric here. Uh, we also expose a REST, and CLI, a REST API and CLI uh, for service providers that like to, to, to make specific uh, calls to us to get specific metrics. Uh, you can do that as well. But when I go down to the backups tab here, you know, like Brian talked a little bit about, is you can start categorizing, you know, again, in the tenant space, you can start categorizing and building service level agreements for your workloads. And what that means is I can start saying, uh, I've got workloads that are at platinum, a gold, a silver, and then what I can do is logically bind those to a, an RPO, RTO, okay? So if you look there, I've got a platinum, silver, and gold. Um, it's a tw two hour, eight hour, and 24 hour RPO respectively. Um, and, and if I dive into the workload, one thing that Trilio does really seamlessly and, and really nice is, is we get uh, not just the data as a part of our backup, right? You know, not just a volume and not just a file system, right? Because again, we would be legacy at that point. That's just not cloud, right? That's not how we want to do things. What we do do is again, tap in each service API 
I can now get all the metadata about that cloud at that point in time to capture it, okay? So we'll talk to Nova, we'll talk to Neutron, we'll talk to Cinder, we'll talk to Keystone. We'll do all that under the covers. And the reason why we do that is if I look at this workload that has a three VM workload set defined, if I click on the snapshots, these are my uh, incremental points in time that I've captured from that workload from those three VMs, okay? So if I dive into my latest uh, incremental capture, what you'll see here is the information about the backup, okay, size, how long it took, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll see here uh, in a tab form here, I can go through each one of these VMs. And what you'll see is uh, I grab the IP address associated with the VM. I grab which network it's a part of. I, I get if there's scripts registered within the Kimu guest agent. But additionally, I get the instance information. I get the security groups that the VMs are a part of. I get the flavor, the make and model of the VM from a compute disk and RAM standpoint. I get which network that that is tied to. And I get the volume types and volume configurations, okay? So what, what you'll see here is if, when I capture this information, in addition to the data, what I've effectively exposed to my tenant is the exact point in time, much like Mac Time Machine, for your cloud for the tenant okay and not to really kind of go keep you know brian's done a great job but if i come back here um not, backup is is kind of the necessary evil but what i want to expose is getting all that metadata now what i can do is i can flip it on the tenant now i can expose from the tenant point of view i can recover or interact with that data okay so we, we expose a few different operations of of, of restoration uh, the first one I'm hovering over is called one-click restore. And the definition of that is if those three VMs that are a part of that workload have been deleted, if they've been corrupt, whatever it might be, one-click restore takes that exact point in time, metadata and data, and it restores back into production where it came from, the exact look and feel of that cloud. Volumes, network, IP addresses, uh, availability zones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're putting it right back where we got it. Okay, we took, we took that, um, that functionality a little bit, uh, uh, okay, maybe I don't wanna touch the VMs per, per se, maybe you know, with an in-place restore, what I've exposed now is maybe the VMs are in, in a good state, but I've got some device issues, right? My, my hard disk or virtual disk stuff is, is you know, it's just not readable, something happened, my application went a little wonky there. So in-place restore, allows me to go ahead and define, so if I click on one click, I can go, I can take each one of these uh, VMs and I can say restore the VM or restore just the boot disk. I can say restore the VM, uh, restore the boot disk or re restore the, uh, the cinder volume associated with it. So these are all multi-select. So I can deselect and select, include or exclude whichever component I want. And again, this kind of gets you per VM, per, vo you know, per volume uh, that I can restore just uh, one element of that virtual machine or virtual machines, okay? And then like Brian, Brian did a great job of, of explaining this. The next option is a selective restore. You know, maybe, maybe what I don't want to do, maybe I don't want to interact with the source data at all, right? I don't want to touch the, you know, I want to take my workload and I want to push it to uh, a different region or a different availability zone, right? Uh, more importantly, when I do that, you know, different availability zones, different resources for, per se, I can then go ahead and say, hey, put those VMs on a, a, an entire different network, okay? All three VMs on a different network. I can go ahead, if I have different volume structures, LVM, iSCSI, Ceph, you name it, I can tie it to different volume structures. So if it's LVM, I can make it Ceph, or Ceph, I can make it LVM. And then for each VM instance, the nice thing here is I can, number one, rename the VM, Right, we'll show you the source. Number two, I can reflavor it. Again, uh, disparate resources potentially in different different regions or different locations. So I can make a large, a tiny, a tiny, a large, whatever it may be. And then I can put the instance in a different availability zone. So I click on here, I can go to availability zone number two or Nova, pick or choose. Now the nice thing about that is I can do that per VM. And as you'll see here is you can even do the volume structure. So I can put my VMs in availability zone number two, put my 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 you know test ball here into a different zone as well and, and the nice thing about it is you can start to basically build this point in time of this cloud and reconstruct it and put it somewhere else use cases are test and development um you know 
uh, patch Tuesday for Microsoft. I, maybe I don't want to test my application and all these updates in, in prod. I can respin the entire, you know, uh, the, ex, the, the entire cloud into a different region and then basically test those, uh, the patches there as well. So you start getting into a little bit, you know, maybe some compliance, a little bit of assurity that the uh, security is there, everything's going to work well with your applications. Okay. And then the last thing here is, is, is maybe I don't even want to interact with the VM at all. Okay. Maybe I just want to do a, a, a logical mount of the volume structures associated with the VMs and then retrieve a file or a folder. So Trilio offers up this mount snapshot functionality. And what we do is we will actually ship a, a Ubuntu based uh, VM that you'll mount these volume structures to. Uh, we expose a web interface or a CLI interface that you can go ahead. Uh, the mount snapshot takes roughly 30 seconds, as much as the time as it takes to, to present the disk and rescan the adapters. And then the, the tenant can then go ahead and uh, search their files, grab whatever they want, download it locally, you know, SCP, SSHFS, whatever, whatever the tenant needs to do to get that data from that point in time, extract that. Okay, so when you start thinking about recovery here, you know, backup's one thing, but where, where, the, where the value to Trilio is, is from the restoration. Uh, you know, leg the legacy approach, one thing I'll say here is some people are good at just volume structure stuff, some people are good at you know, scripting file system stuff, but you cannot guarantee an exact point in time with the exact flavor, the network configuration, the volume type to restore the entire tenant space. And that's Trulio's bread and butter. That's exactly what we do. The last thing I'll show you here is um, we've expanded the mount operations. So we, we've exposed a, a nice workload search here. So I can search for file structures within my workload. Um, I can go ahead here and, and select whichever VM I, I'm, I'm curious of. Uh, what I do by default is I can filter on all the snapshots. So this will give me every point in time that I've run as a part of the workload. I can go ahead, I can, I can do a date range, start and end date. So I can say, only show the points in time of the last two days, five days, five weeks, whatever it is. And then lastly, I can go ahead and just filter out those snaps based on um, you know, a quantifiable number of snapshots. Okay. So once I select that, let's just show you, show you live. Uh, here, here's the demo guys here. So I'll just search for uh, Etsy Star here. And what, what it will do is it'll show me, uh, I only picked one finite resource, one snapshot. But what we're going to do under the covers, if you had you know, 100 listed, we were gonna, we're going to do a real live. Uh, we don't index everything um, because of how we store the data in, in, in native QCAT 2 format. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the search result in every single point in time that I've captured. So here's the point in time at 115 that I searched. We searched, uh, we, we gave you everything with Etsy star. Okay, the next release, we're gonna actually have a recovery window here that'll actually do the, 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 re the recovery as well. Um, but this at least gets you the, the snapshot ID where it is and you can go ahead and, and restore that. Okay, so that's from the tenant space. Again, uh, Trilio.io, request a demo. We can go into architecture. We can go into uh, how we do what we do. Uh, but last thing I want to show you here is uh, if you put your hat from a tenant space into the admin space, uh, we expose the same at the very bottom here. We expose a new tab here called backup admin. And then what we do here is from a, the administrator point of view, um, I can get a holistic view of the cloud. So if I have you know, one tenant or I have a thousand tenants, I can see holistically what's going on within my cloud. Um, I can see all the workloads here. I can see which availability zone, what the name is, what their performance are, what's passing, what's failing. I can tell you per, per tenant, per workload, how much storage they're using, uh, where it's writing data to, okay? Um, another nice thing that we can do is we provide a configuration backup. So if I come over here to uh, oh, live demo, there we go. Uh, my team's rebuilding right now. But effectively what we can do, OpenStack, the, the community has a nice, um, has a nice knowledge base article of all the services and, and file systems and uh, MySQL databases to back up per component of OpenStack. Trilio uh, backs that up as well. Okay, so if you're looking for configuration backup within OpenStack, we do that. Um, here's our Trilio Vault VMs, uh, our lightweight data movers here. Again, Brian did a great job. So we have a, a lightweight Python based module that sits idle inside each compute node. And then when each job is running, it wakes up and, and does the operation. Um, so this case, I have two. 
We give you the global storage used, consumed. We have an onboard audit system. We have your, you know, your mail home if you want to do SMTP, and then our licensing here. So I'm kind of run, pushing the edge here on time. I, I'm getting pinged here to, to, to wrap it up. Um, that, in the essence, uh, you know, if there's any questions, you know, Tom, uh, I mean, uh, Lisa, maybe we can jump into that. I'm sure there's probably a, a few, but um, I want to give enough time to answer some questions and answer before we, uh, before we run out of time here. Okay, thanks, Billy. Gosh, that vault dashboard was actually pretty cool. I like that. Well done. Did you guys build something on top of Horizon, or is that just straight from OpenStack? Yeah, so it's just our own API calls into, into, into Horizon. Yep. So yeah, well done. Uh, the, 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 the thought process was why, why give a, you know, why put another management tool in front of the user when we don't need to? Exactly. And good job with the demo. It must have been the demo goddess that was looking after you. Well done. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so we're going to open it up to q and I think there's places you guys can type questions in if you have them. Um, I actually have a question for Brian, um, because I understand that you uh, test a lot of data protection products each year and, um, or projects, and so I was just kind of curious if you could talk about the, the kinds of, of data protection products that you, you like to look at and what that process looks like. It, it, that's great. We've been uh, we've been doing this now for you know more than a dozen years, and we we do anywhere between ten and twenty products a year, and so that's everything from the majors, uh, you know, the, the Veritas Net Backup, IBM Nail Spectrum Protect, uh, Commvault, um, and to startups and, and emerging companies like Trio Vault and and Veeam. I mentioned we do a lot of work with Veeam as well. So it, it, this is actually a, a place where we have a, a really strong heritage and a, and a reputation of understanding, being able to communicate and, and see whether stuff works as advertised. So we've tested just about everything and we kind of stay current and have seen the latest and greatest. And what we're seeing here in Trilio about that really is, it's the new trend is do native services, getting rid of APIs, um, you know, modern RESTful GUIs, uh, you know, RESTful API controls so you can integrate and monitor. All the best of uh, the new stuff is what we're seeing in Trilio about. Okay, very cool. Um, so, and Billy, if you can also talk a little bit about, um, I, I saw that you talked about the distros that you have out there, but what, what about, how about the OpenStack cycle that you're on? I understand you guys are on Okada, is that right? Yeah, it is, yep. Okay, so, so yeah, maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the upgrade cycles work. I think that might be interesting for, for people who go through it as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a hot word, right? So, I, I really put pressure on my team um, I really want to stay cutting edge on features and functionality, number one, but, but I want to be up to date on, you know, it's as it's, it's, it's tight as we can to the release cycle from OpenStack, right? So, you know, with, with uh, the release cycle of, 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 of the community, um, I, I kind of put the team on a, a quarterly release cycle, okay? So at the, end of, at the end of every quarter, you will get new code from Trilio that supports, it could be anything from just features or it could be the latest release of OpenStack. You know, for example, it'll be Pike for the next quarter, for example, right? So, um, so that's from a, from a from a DevOps perspective. We take from the the, the spear down. Hopefully, we're going to be max time out of sync is probably six weeks of of a release. Okay. Uh, from a from an upgrade perspective within Trilio, um, again to make things really easy, uh, the Trilio Vault virtual appliance is built from the ground up as a stateless VM. Okay, we store all our metadata, our internal database all our configurations onto the repository. And our upgrade path is just as, e is just as easy as launching a new Trilio with the new inter internal code core components and then just import the work, import the metadata. That, that's really all it takes. So the upgrade cycle with Trilio takes roughly five, five minutes or so. Wow, okay, impressive. Um, okay, so I actually don't see the question um, panel on my screen. Uh, I don't know if uh, Tom or Caitlin or anybody else who can see the dashboard um, wants to yep. read out a question. Oh yeah, Caitlin, why don't you read out um, if Wonderful. You the questions. I have a question for Brian. Uh, just curious to know what was the RPO or RTO for your lab validation and was the workloads rate? Or what was the workloads rate? 
So the uh, the RPO RTO we were testing with um, uh, a variety. Uh, we saw the gold, silver, platinum, or platinum. Um, so we tested with uh, you know minutes, hour, and day. Uh, so we tested different RPOs. Um, recovery time objectives um, were on our minutes for uh, selective restores. Um, I don't have the information for what it took to spin up when we did the remote recovery, but that, that was, it was minutes, um, it was relatively quickly, but we need to restore that up. I think I, I answered the first part. I'm not sure what the second part of the question was. Um, the second part was, uh, what was the workloads rate? I'm not quite sure I understand what that question is. Okay. No worries. We can, uh, we can follow up with them after, uh, after the call. I have, um, okay. I have two questions here for Billy. Um, when you restore a single file, do you need to restore the whole VM image? And secondly, are the vault backups encrypted? Uh, great, great questions. Uh, no, the, uh, the, the file restore has nothing to do with the VM. So absolutely not. So that is literally just the file that we can grab from the backup image. Um, Again, whoever asked that, we can do. We can take that out. I'll show you exactly how it works. And then the second question was: uh, Are our, our backups encrypted? Um, they can be. Uh, we really want to leverage the technology that is around us, right? So we support everything from Swift to NFS, uh, working on uh, Ceph-based target today. So w the repository, um, it, you know. The, the backups can be either encrypted at, at, the, at the target repository uh, if, if the uh, tenant or the admin chooses to do so. So it's, it's up to the team. Great, and one more question here for Billy. Uh, there's a project called Raksha for backup. Does the Trilio follow that or set a separate standard? Yeah, that's, the, those two words are synonymous. So our CTO and co-founder, uh, I think four years ago, uh, actually wrote that technical specification for the community. So um, Project Rockshaw is is Trilio. So that's, uh, it gives us a nice four year head start on, on this on this initiative, which is a good thing. But uh, yeah, those, the, the Rockshaw is, is Trilio as a corporation. Great, um, can, for Billy, um, can we have the architecture and how this can be implemented in OpenStack in customized environment? Yes, I can. Um, how much time do we have? If, I, if you want, I can share a slide. Let's see here. No, we'll um, we'll follow up individually oh. with um, okay. with this question. But thank you. Okay. But the last thing I'll say, I, I can verbally add, add to it. So, uh, Trilio, just to get, give a little context for people listening today, or, or whenever they decide to, to wrap up on this. So. Uh, Trilio ships uh, a virtual appliance in, in a QCOW2 format, um, and it'll sit on top of a KVM box, okay? Um, we install and register a API endpoint at the control plane, and then the only thing that's required beyond that is a lightweight Python data mover that sits on each one of the compute nodes. Um, these can be installed manually uh, through some sort of local scripting or, or just you know, dot slash run it. Um, or we can provide you with um, playbook uh, scripts with an Ansible, or we've actually had some requests for Chef. So we can provide the, the scripts that you can plug into your Ansible playbooks to deploy it uh, seamlessly within your DevOps play for your cloud. So we, we can work with the team on that as well. Great, and the, uh, the performance window you showed, what kind of performance are you monitoring? Disk IO or others? Is that, for, is that for Brian or for Billy? So I had an, an, an Yeah, answer. well, I think it's probably a Billy question. We were showing uh, throughput elapsed time for uh, for the, for backups to show the incremental, but I, I think maybe the question might be Billy. You, you showed some monitoring um, and the performance monitoring graphs, and yep. so what what are we showing there? And I think the answer is a little bit of all of the above, right? Yeah. So we we monitor our jobs based on runtime and and and, and data rate of change, right? So. The the lines you sh the lines you saw the lines you saw were a runtime of the job, 
uh, plus how much data moved. And then we kind of correlate that, those numbers. So, you know, we don't do any like iometer or, or backend disk utilities that, that go ahead and say, yeah, there's this thrashing and, you know, you got this, this for hotspots. We're just monitoring how fast we write the data and how much data we're writing. Or restoring, excuse me. Okay, if that's the last question, uh, Caitlin, are there any more uh, queued up? Yes, I have one more. Um, for, Bill, for you, Billy, can you talk about how you can architect performance around Trilio? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the benchmark that we set is it's actually really simple, right? Because I coming back from my background days of EMC and we have had big tool teams and performance teams. Um, the Trilio architecture is our baseline performance metric is really simple. It's the how fast you can write a file with a CP command. So if you do a Linux based CP, if you move a file from source to destination, that's our transmission rate. Because the reason why I say that is architecturally, there's infrastructure that's faster or slower and, and network bottlenecks and you know, things that are not directly tied to us as a, as a, as a product. But our benchmark is how fast the CP runs, plus or minus how much, how fast we can get the metadata, which is me measured in a matter of one or two minutes. So CP command plus the, 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 the operations of metadata transfer and reconstruction. Okay, thank you very much, Billy. And thank you so much, Caitlin, for jumping in and, and helping us with our technical difficulties. Really, really appreciate your help there. Um, and I really want to thank, uh, thank my, the team here this morning. You guys have been listening to Brian Garrett, who's the Vice President of ESG Lab, and Billy Fields, who is the Director of the Cloud Architecture for Trilio. And I am Lisa Marie Amphi from the San Francisco Bay Area OpenStack User Group and OpenStack Ambassador for the U.S. And we really appreciate you joining our online meetup this morning. It was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks so much, guys, and um, thanks, everyone. And if you've missed any part of this, there will be a recording posted at some point somewhere. So coming to, you know, at an internet near you, you, you can find it later if you want to review any of this. Um, you also know where to contact teams um, at Trilio or at ESG Lab if you have any further questions for any of us. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.